Good afternoon. How's everyone doing? So uh, my name is Jared Smith, and uh, I want to talk today about how you can create a culture of a sustained contribution within your company. Um, before I get into too much introduction, though, I want to talk just a little bit about uh, how thrilled I am to be here in Hong Kong. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I've had a great time the last couple of days here in the city, and uh, really looking forward to the rest of the week. Um, Anybody know what this Chinese symbol on this hat represents? I mean, the lights are a little bright, but I'll see if somebody raises their hand. What, is that, what does that symbol stand for? As I understand it, that's the Chinese symbol for good luck or good fortune. And uh, I feel pretty lucky to be here today. Um, how many other people in the audience feel lucky? I see a couple of people that feel lucky. That's good. It's always good to be lucky. I think I'm about the luckiest person I know. And I'm going to tell you why, just really briefly here. Um, because when I started my career, I, I, I studied electrical engineering, got my degree, and uh, I thought that was, that was pretty cool. And then I got the best job in the world. I got to be a programmer. And I could really make, make things happen with code. And that got me into systems administration. I thought, wow, that's really lucky. I get to play with big, big things, set up servers in the data center. That got me into lots of networking. And I thought, oh, that's, that's the best job in the world. I get to play with networks and see how things, packets go from one side to the other and how things route and all kinds of fun things. Then that got me into voice over IP and telephony. And that was kind of a mixed bag. But I still felt pretty lucky because I uh, got to help write a book about open source voice over IP platforms and uh, had, had a lot of fun doing that. Ended up teaching training classes and doing consulting on, on voice over IP for a number of years. And then I got really lucky because Red Hat hired me, asked me to be the Fedora project leader, and helped wrangle about oh, tens of thousands of volunteers um, who helped contribute to Fedora in a number of different ways, whether that's writing code, packaging software, writing documentation, doing QA, translation, uh, you know, design, a, a number of different things. And I thought that, that that was just the luckiest job in the world. And then I got hired by Bluehost. And, uh, I have the best job in the company. My job is, is director of open source outreach, is to reach out to open source communities like the OpenStack community and others, and really support them in, in fun and interesting ways, whether that's through sponsorships, whether that's through speaking at conferences, whether that's um, writing code, you know, pushing code upstream, helping organize events, those, those sorts of things. So I, I really am the luckiest person in the world. And uh, that's really good. And that brings me to why I'm here today at the OpenStack conference to talk to you about building uh, a culture within your company of giving back to open source and contributing to open source. Um, the reason I went through that, uh, that series of slides on, on just how lucky I am was to, to, to show you that in each one of those jobs, people kept asking me the same question. Can anyone guess what that question might be? They keep asking me, how did you possibly convince your boss to pay you to work on open source software. Have you ever heard that question before? Well, I've heard it a lot. And so the, the topic of my talk here today is, you know, is to share some of the things that I've learned about how to really create a, a culture of contribution inside of an organization. Anybody recognize, recognize this guy? I wouldn't recognize him by, by, by the picture if I didn't already know the picture. Um, this is a guy by the name of George Wallace. Um, George Wallace was one of the co-founders of the uh, London School of Economics. And in uh, 1926, he wrote a book called The Art of Thought. And in that book, he, he, he wrote out a methodology for, for wh what he thought was the perfect method for helping the creative process. When you're trying to think through a problem, when you're trying to solve a problem, um, what's, what's the process you need to go through to, to be your most creative? And that, uh, that creative process that he came up with really has, a, has four steps. And so I'd like to go through those over the next few minutes and talk about what those four steps are and apply those to this problem of, well, how can I convince my boss to let me contribute, contribute back to open source and then build a team within my organization that contributes back to open source. So the first step is preparation. Makes sense, right? You need to be prepared before you go ahead and, uh, and, and start your, um, your down the road. The second is incubation. You need to give it a chance to start to grow, start to flourish, start to develop. With that will come illumination. You'll start to have those aha moments 
and say, oh, yeah, that's, that's what I need to do. That's, that's how this is going to go. And uh, last but not least, we get to the implementation phase where we actually get to go do the thing that it is you're trying to do. Um, and so I'm going to take the, the next few minutes and talk, talk through these four steps in, in a little more concrete detail about how to give back to, uh, you know, to open source and, and really build that culture with it in your organization. I think one of the most important things, especially during the uh, preparation phase, is to think not just in terms of, oh, I've got this patch, I want to contribute it back upstream, but to think in terms of connections. Um, one of the things I absolutely love about uh, the time I get to spend in open source communities is the, the, you know, the connections that I make, the people I meet, the events I get to go to. Um, I absolutely love events like, uh, like this and, and other open source conferences. And I, as much as I like the, the, the talks like this, the uh, design sessions and those sorts of things, I really also enjoy the hallway track because I like making connections with people. I like you know, sharing ideas. I like bouncing ideas off of other people and see their reaction. And so from the beginning, when you, when you start going down the path of trying to build a, a, a team of contributors within your organization, think about connections and what connections they're going to make, both inside your organization and obviously on the outside in the, in the greater open source community. Another thing that I'll, uh, I, I think is very, very important as you go down this road is to prepare yourself from a legal standpoint. Make sure you understand uh, the nuances of, you know, how does copyright law apply to open source code? How does trademark law apply to open source code? How does patent law apply to open source code? And those, as, as much as we as developers often want to say, ah, I don't, don't want to have to worry about that. I don't want to have to deal with the legal team. You know, that's, that's just implementation details. I'll get to that later. Um, I found through, through lots and lots of experience uh, for both good and bad that having a good, strong understanding of the legal aspects of, of software development really, really helps, especially when you're talking with, with the executives in the organization, when you're talking with the legal team, if you can talk in their language, that really helps. So it's going to take a little bit of study. It's going to take a little bit of work uh, you know, for you to really be prepared you know, to talk on, on, on those terms, but it will help you as you build your team. Now let's talk a little bit about the, the, the incubation phase. And I had to put a cube on the screen, a little verbal pun there, you know, the incubation phase. When you start to say, OK, let's, let's start, let's get a project together. Let's, let's, make, uh, let's make an effort to try to get this pushed through let's, uh, and, 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 and contribute it back upstream. Um, do I happen to have any Canadians in the room by chance? I think we had a Canadian earlier. He was on stage, but I think he's, he's left the room. All right, anybody recognize that, that uh, logo by chance? It's for the Hudson's Bay Company out of Canada. Anybody know what the Hudson's Bay Company is? So the Hudson's Bay Company was founded by King Charles II of England in the year 1670. And it was a, a company specifically set up for uh, for uh, doing trapping and, and, and fur management uh, of animals in, in North America, Canada, and the north, northern part of, of the United States. And it's the longest continually running um, uh, corporation in the, in, in the Western Hemisphere. So it's it, it been in, in active existence since 1670. Um, when the, the members of the Hudson Bay Company were out doing their trapping and, and catching their furs, um, they often had to carry everything they needed, often for months at a time, with them, and they were often wandering through the wilderness all alone or in small groups. And so they, had to, they really had to make sure they had all the supplies that they would need for that, those extended periods that they were out on their, you know, on you know, going through the wilderness looking, you know, trying to trap animals and, and that sort of thing. So they had an interesting methodology that they used when they started any new big uh, venture. The very first day, they would get up in the morning, they would get all their gear together, they would hike down the road maybe a mile, maybe two miles, just a, just a, a, a short distance, and then they would stop and they would set up camp. And they would try to have camp set up you know, before noon. And then they'd get all their gear out, test it all, make sure it was working. That way, if they forgot something or they realized them, their gear wasn't going to work, well, they could always hike back the two miles back into town, buy or borrow or steal whatever they needed, and then and, and then make it back to camp that day. So they made, always just made a very, very short foray the very first day. 
then the second day they would go on and, and do a normal, uh, a normal stay journey. And I think we can use this same thing whenever we embark on a new project, whether it's an, a, a new software project or, or something like continuous deployment like, the, like was in the last presentation or, or if we're rolling out a, a new piece of software. Um, anytime you can try, just make a small incremental step, that very first step, just to test the water, see how the gear goes, see how the equipment works, see how the, the, the business processes work, that's a good thing. So I recommend that if you're, if you're actively trying to contribute back to an open source project, that you make a, a small step the very first time. And that brings us to, to step number three, which is the illumination phase, and, and probably one of the hardest phases in, in this whole prospect. Um, in this step, this is where you have to go convince your manager, you go have to convince the CEO, you convince the legal team to, to, to let you work on open source. Now, maybe you're lucky and your organization you know, gets open source and, and it's not that hard to convince them to, to let you do that, but in many organizations, that's, that's simply not the case. Um, either, either they don't have an understanding of open source or they don't have an understanding of why it would be important to contribute back to, to communities of practice like that. And so this is your chance to uh, you know, reach out to the executives, reach out to the legal team, and explain why it is that you want to contribute back. Now, the very first thing you need to do is need to speak their language. Um, they often don't speak you know, source code language. They, they often don't speak you know, um, geek, to, to, to put it bluntly. But they, you know, typically, a business manager, he's going to speak finance. That's his language of choice, right? He's going to look at this in terms of dollars and cents. And he's going to ask you, well, if you're spending your time contributing back to open source, how does that make me money? Or how does that save me money? Right? So what, what's, what are the kinds of, uh, of responses you might have to that question to help him understand that there really is some economic value and, 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 and value in general in, in contributing back to open source? What are, what are some of the ways you might, you might help convince him of that? Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that. First, the first thing I typically do when, a, when, a, when an executive asks me, well, why, you know, why should I let you work on open source? You know, what's what's the, the, the economic benefit to that? Is to talk about infrastructure um, and, and ask, what does it cost for us to reinvent the wheel? Now, how many people in here are software developers of some sort or another? How many people in here are systems administrators or integrators, those sorts of things? Quite, uh, quite a number. So how many times have you gone out and written a piece of code or gone out and, 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 and built a system only to find out that somebody else has already done that and they've already done it better and you should have just looked at their stuff in the first place? I'll, I'll, I'll admit I can't tell you how many times I've done that. Probably, you know, I can count five or six times just off the top of my head. And so, you know, you, you can ask the executives that. You can ask your boss, hey, you know, if we keep reinventing the wheel or if we go pay some vendor to reinvent the wheel for us and then find out it's the wrong size wheel, um, what does that cost us both in terms of time and in, times of, in, in terms of money? And so that's, you know, that's the first thing is kind of structure. The other thing you need to explain to your boss is that, you know, participating in, a, in an open source community is a two-way street. It's not that just I'm, I'm taking my time... I'm, and, and, and using that give code back to the community, but you're taking back from the community as well. And, 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 and typically in, in open source communities, because the cost of, of, of copy and reuse of code is, is fairly inexpensive, almost free, um, then you, know, you almost always get more than you, than you give back simply because you know, it's it, the, the economies of scale there. So, so think of it in terms of you know, structure, infrastructure, tooling. Um, most of the times you're in the business not of building scripts or writing programs or, or that sort of thing. You're in the business of, of web hosting or you're in the business of selling services to your customers or you're a restaurant or you're a bakery or, or something like that, right? Your expertise as, a, as an organization is typically not in you know, running an IT team. It's in delivering what you deliver to your customers. And so anytime you can not have to reinvent the wheel, not, not have to uh, you know, build everything from scratch, that's a, that's a good thing. The second thing I, I typically talk about with, with executives when they're asking why, why contribute back to open source has to do with uh, employees and labor costs. Um, labor costs, uh, as you all know, continue to go up and up and, and, and you know, are typically a major part of a of a business owner's budget, and if, if labor costs are tight, then 
why wouldn't you want to do something that either increases the value of your, of your current employees or encourages more employees to want to come work for you? And so typically I see that when, when a person participates in an open source community, they typically have a broader uh, vision of the, both of the technology that they're, that they're dealing with, but also a, 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 uh, you know, a broader um, uh, set of communication tools because they're used to talking to people, whether it's via email or mailing lists or forums or you know, IRC chat. They, they typically are better communicators because they, that's, the, that, that's the way they interact with people. It's not always you know, face-to-face communication. Um, you know, I, I also find that uh, typically you can use you know, this opportunity for maybe you've got some junior developers or some junior admins. You, you want to help you know, bring them you know, up to speed a little quicker. You want to help them you know, be, be more valuable as employees. And that participation in an open source community is, is a great... Uh, you know, a, a schoolhouse, so a way for them to learn and grow and stretch and develop, and and that really participation in open source communities is a very low cost training program. Oftentimes, for helping them get up to speed, I see too many times business managers look at an employee or hire an employee simply on what they know now, and not necessarily for what that person is going to grow into over the next six months or a year or two years or five years. Um, Taking that attitude of, yeah, you know, we want to make our employees the best, the best we can is, is, is often a very good thing. So that's, that's kind of the language that, that, that I typically use when I'm talking with the, with the business leaders. Um, talking with the legal team is a little bit different. They speak a different language. It's not English. It's not code. It's not finance, typically. They speak this language. And I'll give you a guess as to see if you can figure out what, what that's called. Some of you have played this game before. What's this game called? It's called risk, right? This, 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 this is the uh, language that attorneys typically speak. And so typically when you're, when you're speaking with the legal team about, hey, can, can we contribute this code back to open source? Can we t participate in this open source community? Can we take, you know, and launch our own open source community around some of our code? Typically, uh, the answers you're going to get back from them are not based on, you know, rational thought. They're not based on, you know, is the code awesome or not? It's not based on, you know, you know, will this save us all kinds of money? It's, it's based on risk. And typically, you know, participation in an open source community, you know, the, the risk is fairly small, um, but the attorneys like to you know, check those boxes off and, and, and go through the thought process of analyzing the risk and figuring out what those risks are. Um, the other thing that I've found through experience is that typically attorneys like to hear this sort of a, of a message from other attorneys. So if you can find an attorney that's up to speed on open source law and, and get them to talk to your legal team, that often helps. Um, there are groups out there like the Software Freedom Law Center or the Free Software Foundation or other groups like that where you can have their attorneys talk to your attorneys since they all speak the same language and help you know, allay some of those fears, you know, help them understand what those risks are and, uh, and, and move forward that way. I've been very lucky at, uh, at, at Bluehost in, in that our legal team well, both you know, understands open source and is very um, happy to see us contributing back to open source. It, it was very, very refreshing when I started working there to, to, to see that they really got it and, and really you know, understood those risks and, and not only were willing to take on those risks, but were, were, you know, were, were willing to help support those of us who, in, in the company who, who do contribute back to open source because it's a, it's a big part of what we do as an organization. All right, so now we're on to step four, which is the implementation phase, and this is where you actually get to dive in and actually do the, do the real work, right? So I have a number of slides here that I want to go through to talk about you know, what are kind of best practices as you go through this and actually start the, the work of contributing back to uh, an open source community or, or trying to build an open source community around a piece of code. Um, I will warn you that this is a lot of work. It's not simple to do. It's not something that's, that's trivial. Um, I put this slide up here um, because this is, uh, I, I have a favorite Chinese proverb that says, talk doesn't cook rice, right? So what do I, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that we can talk about what, what's the best practice and what you need to do, but oftentimes people take shortcuts. Oftentimes people don't really want to you know, go through all the steps necessary to do the hard work to contribute back in a proper way. So 
Here's some best practices that, that I've seen throughout the years that, that help with that. First of all, figure out what your, what your measurement metric is going to be. How are you going to know whether you're successful or not? How is your boss going to know whether you're being effective or not? How is the legal team going to know, you know how, how are they going to measure the risks that are being taken? Um, if you don't set those things ahead of time, it's often um, you know, a little surprising when you get to your year-end review and, and your boss doesn't know whether to you know, give you a thumbs up or thumbs down for your work because there's no metric there. So I strongly encourage that you think about what metrics do I want to use to either you know, measure our contribution or measure the community that we're, that we're building, those sorts of things. Um, Another thing that I, I see way too often is that an organization says, yeah, we wanna, we're going to take this code and we're going to make it open source. And what do they do? They take a snapshot in time, they package it up, they throw it over the wall, and nothing happens. And I've seen that time and time and time again. And that doesn't really build an open source community. That doesn't often help a community because Contribution to a community is more than just lobbing a, a piece of code over the wall and hope, hope, you know, hoping that it's useful for somebody. Um, I was, uh, I was uh, asked to come in and do a little bit of consulting a couple of years ago on a, on a, on a, a government-led project in the United States uh, on, uh, to, do with, uh, to do with veterans' affairs and, and health care information for, for veterans. And it was amazing to me that, 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 the, that the managers over this project absolutely got the concept of open source. They wanted to make the code open source, but they didn't want to have any kind of a feedback loop. They didn't want to accept patches from anybody. They didn't want all the great things that come with, you know, building an open source co community around a, around a piece of code. What they really wanted to do is just have this code and then lob it over the wall and forget about it and not have to deal with the other aspects of uh, of you know, maintaining a community, having a feedback loop, letting other people contribute back and help make your, your project better. So let me, let me ask a quick question. How many people ha you know, work with really great engineers within their organization, or really great developers, or really great networking folks? Anybody want to publicly raise their hand and say they don't work with really great folks? OK, just kidding. Um, oh, my coworkers are going to get me now. No. Um, one of the secrets of, uh, of open source communities is no matter how great the people are within your organization, and no matter how many of them you hire, there's always smarter people on the outside. And there's a whole lot more smarter people on the outside. So I strongly encourage you to find ways to, to build those feedback loops. Find ways to let people outside your organization help you do your job better and help you solve your problems faster. So don't just lob code over the wall. Try to build bridges instead of walls. Um, another thing that, uh, that comes to mind, especially as, as I've been in the, in the summit here this week and talking to, to some of the, the OpenStack developers, and in particular to a couple of the uh, technical leads, is the difference between strategic contributions and tactical contributions. Now, I think it's an easy trap to fall into as a, as a, as a developer to say, oh, I'm going to go solve that particular bug, or I'm going to go add this feature, or I'm going to fix this little thing so it's more efficient, or you know, I'm going to go write this piece of documentation so other people can, can help exp you know, understand how this you know, piece of code works. Um, too many times we get focused on the individual tools or the individual bugs or the individual features, kind of the tactical side of things. And it, it's often helpful and refreshing to take a step back and try to help out with strategic contribution. Um, I can't tell you, you know, how many times I've talked to people in, 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 in big software projects like OpenStack where the, 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 the kind of the core maintainers say, hey, you know, it's great that so-and-so is working on his little driver over here and so-and-so is working on his little piece over here and, and George over there, he's working on his little piece over there, but I wish they would take a step back and look at the broader picture of the project and contribute to things that help the project overall and not just the one particular aspect that they're, they're focused on. And I know I, I can understand that sometimes, you know, if, if you're, a, you're, a, you're a software vendor and your software needs to work with another piece of software, you're focused on that interoperability. But that doesn't mean that's the only place you have to contribute to that project. Please take a step back, take a broader view, and try to help the, 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 the projects overall. Um, honestly, I don't know what this map is really meant to, meant to 
to be other, other than somebody had a big strategy about how to map out parts of North America and, and connect it to Europe. I'm guessing it's some sort of network map or something from the 60s, but, but, it, but it made me think uh, there's some strategy behind it, you know. Take, take the strategic view, even while you're in the trenches and working on those tactical things, um, you know, don't, don't, don't forget to, to take a step back and look at the broader view. Another thing that I strongly encourage uh, you know, companies to do is, is find someone who, who kind of has the passion for open source within the organization, who really gets it and can communicate that well, and uh, appoint them as either the, the open source officer of the company or, you know, or, the, or the lead of, a, of an open source committee within the organization so that when people are contributing open source code, when, people, when there are questions that come up from the executives or the legal team, that they have somebody to go to to get the right answers and try to avoid the problem that we often have of fear, uncertainty, and doubt when there's not one person that, that, that has a clear answer to, to some of those questions. And this is the, one of the things we've done in, in, inside the Bluehost and our, our parent organization is, is, is come up with some, some open source policies and an, and an open source officer to, to handle these sorts of things so that everybody knows where to go to get a, to, to, to get a question answered and you know, when, when contributions happen, that we can also take those and, and market those and, 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 and kind of highlight the work that we're doing inside open source communities. So that's a, that's a very uh, valuable thing to do. This also helps, helps lead you down the path of creating an open source policy within your organization. And again, every organization is going to be different on what level of you know, policy they need. But you know, we all know how the attorneys are. We all know how the business leaders are. They like to check the little boxes and make sure that everything is in order. They like meetings. So, you know, have a monthly meeting or a, or a bi-weekly meeting or maybe it's a meeting every three months just depending on your organization. Get the people who are enthusiastic about open source together, have a chance to ask questions, you know, build a policy around contributions um, and then get sign off on that from the, from the executive team. Um, in, in, in our case, our, our open source policy is, is very, very easy. It's if you want to contribute back to an open source project, make sure your manager knows about it so that he can say, yeah, yeah, that's okay to contribute. And make sure the open source officer knows about it so that he can highlight that and inside the community and, and inside the company and uh, make sure that uh, those things are being highlighted and then, and then you're good to go. I've been in other organizations where it's a slightly more formal policy, but either way, you know, come up with what works and, and build a policy around it so that you can apply that consistently. Last but not least, I want to leave you with a, a, a little bit of an analogy and if you can't tell from my slides, I'm, I'm really a visual person. I, I really like photography. I, I, I like capturing people's attention with the, you know, with the images that I put on my slides. And I heard a really, really good analogy a couple of months ago that applies to photography, but I think it also applies to um, some of the things I've shared here today. And that, that analogy is that in photography, amateurs worry about gear, professionals worry about billing and invoicing and, and where their next client is going to come from. And masters worry about light. And I think that, that analogy fits really, rel really well with uh, you know, creating a, a, a corporate culture of contribution to open source in that amateurs are going to worry about the exact mechanics of, you know, how do I you know, how do I contribute? What, do I, what policy do I need to you know, check off? You know, that sort of thing. You know, professionals are worried about, okay, what's this going to cost me to let these guys contribute back to open source? And masters are going to understand the light of open source, the, the really why do we, you know, the philosophical reasons of why we contribute to open source and why that's important. And so your job during this, uh, you know, really during the illumination phase and then during the implementation phase is, is to really help people see that light and then be, 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 you know, be almost like a mirror of reflecting that light and capturing that light in, inside your organization. So uh, with that, uh, I wish you all the best of luck in, in, in your endeavors. I'm, I've left a few minutes at the end here for questions. So uh, we'll, we'll open it up for questions. We'll see if we can track down a microphone. Otherwise, oh, it looks like there's a microphone in the, in the middle of the, uh, in the aisle there. If you've got a question, I'd be happy to answer questions for a few minutes. Don't be shy. If you've got a question, please step up to the microphone. Oh, question right here. Yeah, 
So the question was, in my experience, is, the, is community contribution typically written into the job description for the, for the team members? Um, for some of the companies I've worked for, absolutely it is. Um, so I've had the, the, the opportunity to work for a voice over IP company that was all about open source. Like I said, I, I had an opportunity to work for Red Hat, which is all about open source. Um, Bluehost is very much an open source oriented company. In all three of those, those cases, um, either my job description or, or coworkers' job description actually did have contribution to open source as a major piece of the job description. And in, in, in a couple of cases, I've got uh, two full-time developers who report to me who their entire job description is contribute back to open, open source and upstream communities. They're not even focused on what our needs are internally in the company. They're focused on what is the upstream community need. Um, so yeah, that's, that's not typical, but, uh, but I have seen that, and it, and it really, really helps, because then you have a good way of gauging, are those people not only helping us, but are they helping the greater good, and I mean, helping, helping get the company's name out there inside the, these communities to, to, to highlight the good work that's being done. What, what kind of key performance indicators do, do you have on those? It depends on the individual and, and, and the role. So for the, for the two people, the two developers that report to me, the way I, I, I judge their performance is by following the upstream community and seeing are they active in the community, are they participating in the meetings, do I see them participating on the mailing lists and the forums, are they submitting code patches, are they doing bug triage in the bug tracker, those sorts of things. In other communities I've been in, it's been measured in, you know, how many, how many lines of code did you contribute back to that, or how many meetings did you participate in, or, you know, are the features that you're working on being accepted by the greater community, those sorts of things. It just, it really depends on the indi individual, you know, open source project that you're working in and, and what the, you know, what the business needs are around that interaction with the open source community. Question right here in front. So, so the question is, uh, in the hosting industry in particular, what are my predictions around, you know, the communities and, and, and what's coming next and those sorts of things? You know, I really hate to make predictions, especially on stage. Um, I think, you know, in general, I would say that, you know, that, uh, you know, hosting is, a, is an industry where, in, in, in general, there's, there's a lot of people that, that still don't understand why they might need hosting, and so I think it's a wide open field for you know, more and more businesses to get their, their, you know, their business online, more and more people having a personal website for, for, for whatever reason, you know, blogs and those sorts of things. I think, you know, I think it's, a, it's a pretty interesting time to be in the hosting industry right now, and uh, luckily you know, my, my job isn't to focus on you know, growing the business or anything like that. I get to focus on taking care of our customers and taking care of open source communities. Um, predictions beyond that, I'm not really at, uh, you know, at liberty to, 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 to venture a guess on. Question over here. You're, you're going to have to speak up. I can't hear you. What, what is, my, in my experience, is the best way to adverse, advertise an open source product? You know, open source marketing is a, is a whole ball of wax that's very, very difficult, and it's fraught with danger. Um, too many times people t t try to use traditional, you know, marketing techniques in an open source community, and those usually fall on deaf ears. Um, and so I would be very, very uh, hesitant to, to, to use the traditional marketing techniques, you know, advertising, you know, paid sponsorships, those sorts of things. I think word of mouth is the number one way to get your, you know, yeah, to, to get the word out about an open source project. I think doing things like building easy tutorials, documentation, um, you know, what, you know, meetups, you know, video presentations, you know, YouTube videos, those sorts of things are a good way to help get the word out about your project and help people get started. Um, typically with open source projects, that, at least that I've seen over the last several years, it's not a problem of, of getting people to know, hey, that you've got this project out here and here's how it works. It's helping people get to that next step of, I'm actually installing the software, I'm actually trying the software, oh, I'm learning how to use the software. Oh, no, look, now I'm contributing back, I'm participating on the mailing list or the forums, or oh, I wrote a patch, or now I'm, you know, now I'm contributing modules, those sorts of things. Um, word of mouth is, is very, very important, and people, you know, 
people in the open source communities tend to be, you know, make snap judgments. They'll, they'll download a piece of code, and if they can't get it working in five or ten minutes, they'll go, ah, this is garbage, I'm going to move on to something else. And so anything you can do to lower those barriers to entry, uh, again, whether it be, you know, you know, documentation, tutorials, you know, you know, quick start guides, those sorts of things to help them, you know, get, get their feet, make, get those first two steps into the community, um, that really, really helps. Great. Other questions? We've got just a couple of more minutes for, for questions. I'm sure I don't see any other hands out there. Well, if there's no other questions, thank you for your time. Best of luck in, in everything you do in open source.